Rorschach's journal, October 12th, 1985. Tonight, a comedian died in New York. Dark and dystopic superhero films have come and gone throughout the years. Some with more edge, like Logan, and some with a little more humor, like Super. Yet they all owe a little bit to the famous graphic novel which deconstructed the superhero genre in such an impactful way. The story that has been interpreted so many different ways that you can gleam complete opposite messages depending on your views. And the one that its original creator, Alan Moore, downright refuses to watch. That's right, today we're diving into the dystopic world of Zack Snyder's Watchmen. This city's afraid of me. I've seen its true face. And all the whores and politicians will look up and shout, Save us. And I'll whisper, no. There are few comic book adaptations that had as much trouble getting off the ground as Alan Moore's Watchmen. The film was in development for many decades under many different studios, until the cameras finally got rolling. In a lot of ways, it's a miracle that it even happened. So, for a property that was so revolutionary and beloved, why did they have such trouble? Before we can properly dive into the complicated history of getting this story up on the big screen, we first must look at the publication of the graphic novel itself. Watchmen first appeared in an issue of DC Spotlight in 1985. Subsequently, they would release a total of 12 comics between 1986 and 1987. These issues would be compiled into the graphic novel that adorned comic book store shelves for decades. Everyone remembers the yellow smiley face with a drop of blood on it, right? Absolutely iconic. And we all know about Alan Moore at this point, right? The old curmudgeon comic book creator that has had such bad experiences with his work being adapted that he's just completely removed himself from the process. Well, there's a little more to the story to get you to understand his plight. See, it wasn't just that some of his comics were adapted poorly, as that's something that can happen to any creator. No, instead Moore was brought into litigation after Larry Cohen and Martin Pohl sued Fox for allegedly stealing their script, Cast of Characters. Feeling it was too similar to The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, Cohen and Pohl alleged that Moore was hired to write a comic that featured specific characters so that Fox could then buy the rights from him. Because of this, Moore was forced to defend himself in court for nearly 10 hours. He lamented the process, saying he'd have suffered less if he'd sodomized and murdered a busload of children after giving them heroin. Jeez, Alan, tell us how you really feel. This rightfully left Moore completely against any and all adaptations of his work, which is really too bad as he had created some of the most intriguing comics of the 80s, with From Hell, The Killing Joke, and of course, today's subject. Recognizing the success of the graphic novel, Producers Lawrence Gordon and Joel Silver acquired the film rights in 1986 and set up the movie at 20th Century Fox. Alan Moore turned down scripting duties, duh, and instead they went to future Batman scribe Sam Hamm. Hamm actually rewrote the complicated ending from the original comic, simplifying the third act. Fox, however, didn't have much faith in the project and put it on hold in 1991. Eventually, the film moved to Warner Brothers, where Terry Gilliam boarded the project. Gilliam's Brazil partner, Charles McCown, rewrote the screenplay, but they struggled to get the film made, having gone over budget on their last few movies. Frustrated, Gilliam left the unfilmable project, and Warner Brothers subsequently dropped the movie from its slate. Over the next decade, several writers and directors would board the project from David Hayter to Michael Bay to Paul Greengrass, and even Darren Aronofsky. 
Watchmen was bringing in all sorts of talent, yet even still, the film was never able to enter production, shifting studios from Warner Brothers to Universal to Paramount, until it was eventually shelved yet again. Superhero movies just hadn't made enough impact to prove that you could create a dark film that subverts them and still be successful. In the mid-2000s, Gordon and Lloyd Levin partnered with Warner Brothers to have another go at the film. Having success with movies like Dawn of the Dead and 300, Zack Snyder was approached by Warner to direct, which he graciously accepted, being a big fan of Moore's story. Having David Hayter's script to work from, Snyder brought in Alex Say to rewrite it, bringing it a little more in line with the comic. Funnily enough, Alan Moore has even said that Hayter's script is likely as close as he could imagine anyone getting to Watchmen, which is the highest of praise, but also not Snyder's final shooting script. Due to all the hot potatoing of the property, and the fact that Paramount contributed so much to the film's development, the studio received international distribution rights, as well as a 25% ownership of the final film. So they didn't lose out entirely. But Fox wasn't happy about having helped develop the film, only for it to then be taken by Warner. So they sued, eventually settling after receiving payment as well as a percentage of the worldwide gross. They would also have a stake in any sequels or spin-offs. Filming on Watchmen took place in Vancouver, Canada from a script credited to both Hayter and Say. Doubling for New York City, the film is mostly made up of sound stages and green screen, yet still manages to be somewhat grounded. With a budget of nearly $120 million and its eyes set on an R rating, Snyder and his team had quite the uphill battle. None of you seem to understand. I'm not locked in here with you. You're locked in here with me! Watchmen has always had an interesting story. In an alternate America where costume heroes have helped turn the tide in key moments, someone is starting to murder formerly costumed heroes. Eventually, it's revealed that one of the former superheroes has decided the only way for the world to find peace is to give them a common enemy, Dr. Manhattan. Sure, that's a very simplified way of breaking it down, but I'll be honest, if I go through every plot point, it's going to get convoluted real fast. Let's just say there's a lot of slow motion and death. The world presented here looks familiar, yet has some subtle differences. Due to Dr. Manhattan's intervention, the US won the Vietnam War, and made Vietnam the 51st state. You can even see all the flags with their 51 stars. Because of this success, Nixon won a third term in office. Yikes. But the worry of nuclear war was just as present as in our world. But it all comes together for a package that does its best to pay respect to the precious source material. And it all begins with its stellar cast. My new world demands less obvious heroism. Your schoolboy heroics are redundant. Throughout the many different iterations of the project, Natalie Portman, Rachel Weisz, and Hilary Swank were all considered for the role of Lori Jupiter, aka Silk Spectre 2. But it was Malin Ackerman who ended up landing the role. Then for the role of her mother, the original Silk Spectre, Carla Gugino was cast. Although actresses like Jamie Lee Curtis, Liv Tyler, and even Sigourney Weaver were considered at different points of the film's development. You can really tell by that list of names just how long this bad boy was spinning its wheels. Hot off the success of Hard Candy, Patrick Wilson took on the role of Night Owl, who was essentially a version of Batman. Kevin Costner, Richard Gere, and Christopher Walken were all considered. Wilson even put on 25 pounds to portray Night Owl's alter eagle, Daniel Dryberg, who has let himself go a bit. Snyder found the role of the comedian quite hard to cast, as he wanted a man's man for the gig. Thankfully, Jeffrey Dean Morgan grumpily auditioned and brought the exact aura that Snyder was looking for. He makes the comedian very gruff, but also vulnerable. Not an easy task given some of his actions in the film. For the all-powerful Ozymandias, Snyder really wanted Jude Law for the role, feeling he really embodied him. And the actor was also a big fan of the comic. 
Snyder even met with Tom Cruise about the part. Eventually, though, he went with Matthew Good, whom he described as a beautiful, ageless German Superman. Quite possibly the most popular character from the comics, Rorschach, was actually sought out by its eventual actor Jackie Earl Haley. As a big fan of the original graphic novel, Haley saw Rorschach as a dream role. He even sent in an audition where he put together his own costume and performed in his kitchen. Snyder loved it and cast him in the part. Given that his character's mask is ever-changing in the comics, depending on his emotions, the filmmakers opted for CGI. This allowed for a lot more flexibility when shooting and could more properly represent the Rorschach tests on which the design is based. We even see Rorschach several times throughout the film unmasked and holding an end is nigh sign. Finally, for the major part of Dr. Manhattan, many different actors were looked at, with Keanu Reeves even being offered the part. But it ultimately came down to Billy Crudup. Although the Greek statue-like body was that of Greg Plitt, as the version of Manhattan that we see in the film is entirely CGI. Crudup actually wore this blue-white LED suit to help simulate the light in whatever environment he was in. While the CGI isn't flawless, it's still pretty impressive for 2009. Cinematographer Larry Fong went for a visual approach he termed stylized realism, where they took the bright colors of the comics but combined them with the grit and dirt of the real world. Snyder decided to use the comic itself as the storyboarding for various shots, wanting to honor the original graphic novel as much as possible. The recreated shots really helped the film feel like a love letter. The music of Watchmen came from Tyler Bates, although there were several major songs featured, like Desolation Row, The Times They Are A-Changin', and All Along the Watchtower, all by Bob Dylan. We also received Simon and Garfunkel's The Sound of Silence and Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah. These songs really took over their respective scenes and could almost be viewed as separate music videos. If you'd cared from the start, none of this would have happened. Watchmen was released on March 6, 2009 in the United States and brought in over $55 million on its opening weekend. The film would end its worldwide run at $185 million. While the graphic novel was unanimously praised, the movie was quite divisive, earning a 65% fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes. The critical consensus called the film gritty and visually striking. Watchmen is a faithful adaptation of Alan Moore's graphic novel, but its complex narrative structure may make it difficult for it to appeal to viewers not already familiar with the source material. Original creator Alan Moore has maintained his stance of refusing all royalties and instead giving that money to his creative partners he had on the project. And despite never having seen the movie, Moore has been outspoken about his desire for it to not exist at all. Meanwhile, Moore's collaborator Dave Gibbons worked as an advisor for the film and was even credited. A director's cut of the movie was released that featured an additional 24 minutes of footage. Then there was an ultimate cut that added the animated comic Tales of the Black Freighter into the story and increased the total runtime to 3 hours and 35 minutes. Given the different studios involved, the film would have had to turn a massive profit to even toy with the idea of making a sequel, which they did not. When it came to future roles in the world of superheroes, Patrick Wilson starred as the main antagonist King Orm in Aquaman, and Jeffrey Dean Morgan popped up as Thomas Wayne in Batman vs Superman. While not Marvel or DC, Jackie Earl Haley did appear as the Terror in the short-lived Tick revival from Amazon. Billy Crudup originally had the role of Henry Allen in the Snyderverse, but that has since been taken over by Ron Livingston after scheduling issues. And Carla Gugino was the voice of the ship in Batman vs Superman. So I guess that's something. While we never received a sequel, we did receive a TV series from HBO that would serve as a sequel to the graphic novel, while still paying plenty of homage to the film style. 
The first season was extremely well received, but unfortunately there are no plans for it to return. So if you're wanting to explore the world of Watchmen, you're going to have to stick with the graphic novel or Snyder's film. Zack Snyder's Watchmen isn't going to be for everyone. As a big fan of the graphic novel myself, I've always found myself very bored with Snyder's take and think it's more representative of a music video than an actual movie. But those that like it enjoy it with a passion, so I can't fault them for that. As we step away from the world of anti-heroes, we're getting into the film that Ryan Reynolds is ashamed of. No, no, not that one, the other one. But that's a story for next time. Join us, same movie time, same movie channel.